it's it's a little more than that. I'm here with Stephen Mark, and uh, I mean your body of work is anybody who who looks you up will see that that you worked on some phenomenal things. I'm I'm gonna start early on and sort of work work my way through. Uh, you worked on Alienation, which uh, is sort of I mean if the Who was proto punk, Alienation is sort of the proto modern sci-fi tv show i consider uh later on you ended up working on you know the ramones of of a punk sci-fi tv show whatever which was x-files but starting off with alienation when that project sort of came in front of you what was the expectation was it sort of just okay here's another job coming along you know did you feel it was going to have some sort of staying power or influence or I mean, what sort of when you get projects in general, even now, what sort of expectations do you go into it with? You, you know, uh, the, what's the saying? Something about life being what happens while you're sort of doing something else. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm I'm sure at that's that time of my life, I was. Probably just looking for a job. That would have been what, my like eighty-eight? Was that when that was? Yeah, it was. It started eighty-eight, I believe. It went uh, eighty-eight, eighty-nine. Okay. The the series, and that was the original series. Then obviously they they always do the movies, the made-for-TV well, movies. Well, the, the movie came first. That was it. Was the, the, yeah. the movie which, right. I, which I had nothing to do with. Yeah. But um, um, I, I think that was a time in my life when I was just trying to get established. Mm -hmm. Uh, as an editor, I'd been in a, a, a feature assistant, mm -hmm. but I had never, um, as a feature assistant, hooked into one editor who was going to keep me going from project to project, which is, which if you're going to make the step up to editing as a feature person, and I, I certainly moved to Los Angeles with that kind of goal, I was an A-list feature editor. Um, and I, Hollywood has a tendency to stereotype people. Um, I, for example, even now, you can say all these wonderful things that I've done in television. No one will interview me for a comedy. I'm not considered mm -hmm. a, a comedy. I, well, I was kind of aware, I guess the first, very first uh, series job I took had been, oh, it was a very short-lived show called The Wizard. Um, but, you know, and I knew, and I knew that by saying yes to that, by, by setting up a feature assistant and then taking that job, that I was probably setting myself up for a career as a television editor. I mean, mm -hmm. It was going to be hard to get back in features, but I didn't, it just was the door that seemed to open. Right. And then once that door opened and I was now in that world, alienation must have only been the second or third editing credit I had is on so I was new I was just trying to get myself established I remember that I was pleased to be working with Ken Johnson who was a well-known producer at that point um and uh but yeah it was a job and it was if it was 88 I at that point I had two kids um you know, you, I, I got into the I, I was I was attracted to the film business. I would never set out to be in the film business. I I, start, I started doing film work in Salt Lake City um, because it, it it funded my skiing and camping habit. And after seven years, I realized I had developed a skill and I enjoyed it. So that's when I moved to when I moved to LA. But what I always liked about the business was oh, you, know, you have a job. And then it's over. It's just they like, can tell you, well, we're going to hire you from, you know, January to, to July or whatever it might be, and then you're done. And then go skiing and camping, right? So I could continue with both. You get to the point where you have children. It's a new deal, right? Now suddenly yeah. being employed is stressful, and um, you. Options get constrained, and not that I dislike. I mean, I, I love the alienation, um, but it wasn't as if I was sitting there with six offers, mm -hmm. and I had this project, and I thought, "Oh, this is the one. This is the one I want to do." Um, 
So it came along. I don't even remember what my other options at that point were. I might have, you know, it might at that point have gone off. I made my memory maybe. There was a point in my career around that time when still sort of dreaming of feature, a feature life and having already taken a television job, I uh, took, I, I went to work for Roger Corman, who was like within walking studios and walking distance of where I lived at the time. Actually, not, it's not all that far from where I am right now. But, um, and there was that idea of how many people had hooked up with somebody mm -hmm. that Roger had given a break to and then went on to have careers. I, I, I um, that didn't quite happen for me, but I think I was, I did get called to do alienation and walked out on, on a Roger Corman. I just had, I needed, but for one thing, it was a union job and the difference between Roger and a union job was health benefits, right? So I, it's quite possible I did alienation because I could get my, get my kids insured, you know, right? it, it's, so what I'm saying is that the stuff that seems like, wow, you made these wonderful creative choices, mm -hmm. and what you did, were very often more decisions like, I need to pay my kids soccer bills and, mm -hmm. uh, you know, make sure that they're being fed. Yeah, it's something Francis Ford Coppola, I always bring up this quote, Francis Ford Coppola said, if you're a man and you want to sort of make it in the film industry, the biggest thing he recommends is having a family because once you have, you know, mouths to feed, it sort of becomes not sort of this passion or, or hobby, it becomes your job. You you need to do it to make money and and you become a little less choosy and just start taking every job that comes your way to to be a professional at it. Um, exactly. If I go to a function, say that the American Cinema Editors is doing now and I go and I look and I, I try to recognize, I, I see people I think I know and then I realize that, yeah, I knew them years ago and they, they just don't look quite the same. But <laughs> the, the one overriding feeling I have about being in those situations, I mean, obviously there are people of all ages, now in ACE, but when I see the older people my my age, what I just feel really good to be somebody who managed to survive. Mm -hmm. And you know, I own a house and I uh, have a couple of old cars, but they're paid for. And my kids are growing out of the house, and to have done that primarily with income as an editor, I, there should be a, an award for that. Yeah. You know, I mean, never I mean, mind. You, never what mind. You, you, you got to well. watch TV for a living, right? <laughs> well, actually, it's it's interesting how little television I do watch because I spend mm -hmm. so much time in front of in front yeah. of screens. Um, people are always talking about TV shows, and I haven't seen any of them. So it's it's. Uh, but right, it, it, it there is obviously a lot of magical mm -hmm. things. It, it is creative. Yeah. Uh, it is a great it's job. It does it's make interesting you, you say that because it's sort of like people who work as, you know, at nightclubs. When, whenever I talk to them who work at bartenders or work in nightclubs, whenever they go out, they they say, for me, a night out is to go do laundry and read a book somewhere, you know, somewhere quiet because they want to get away from something that they're doing sure. all, all the time. And it's also because a lot of people I talk to, you also mentioned – going into television wasn't your primary goal. You wanted to work on features. And it's super interesting because a lot of the TV that you worked on sort of changed how television shows are produced and how they look and how they feel, where now you sort of have TV being very cinematic and it's where movies are sort of the Marvel movies, the DC movies, the superhero movies, where it's sort of become more more cartoon and and less sort of taking risks the way television is now and and you were a part of that and it's it feels like you didn't realize you were riding that wave while you were doing it i think i was in my 50s um when not a dissimilar connection contact as, as you made some some fellows film student um sent me an email and said that he wanted to uh, meet me because he was a big fan of my work. And I was like, right, he's probably wants to break in and he's sending this to like a hundred different people. Mm -hmm. And he bugged me for a while and I couldn't quite get together with him. And I put, finally made a time, uh, 
Mm-hmm. Didn't when we would do it, but I when I, <clears throat> once I agreed, and I was you know it was a little creepy because that hadn't happened to me before. And, you know, somebody was a stalker. <laughs> a, I don't know what it is. Um, and when I agreed to him, I, I, and I wrote back, I said, so how many people did you contact before someone finally said yes to you? And he wrote back and said, no, you were the only person I wanted to meet. And again, I wasn't, it was a combination of that's really cool. And who the hell is this guy? <laughs> yeah. It's, it's flattering and, and startling and, all at the same time. Yeah. Well, he was going, uh, he was a student at the Brooks Institute of Photography, except they had a film, a film school. And I ended up getting invited because I, I did meet him. We had a good, nice breakfast and, and I ended up speaking to the school there. I think I mentioned to you in uh, an email that I've, since then I've done teaching because I kind of do enjoy talking about editing, at least the process of thinking about mm-hmm. what to say about it. Um, and it gradually began to dawn on me exactly what you're saying, that somehow while trying to become this A-list and failing, <laughs> this become this A-list feature editor, I had actually developed this reputation as a pretty good television editor. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I guess that, that was saying something mm-hmm. and, um, because I had made a lot of life decisions trying to engineer my way into features like going off to work with Roger Crumman. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they didn't really work out. Uh, and then it became like, I guess, I guess what I ended up doing was pretty cool. Then a few years ago, I, re- I retired. And since I retired, I get, seem to get more calls about going to work than I ever did. I mean, if I, if I could have gotten these many calls about work when the kids were little and it was, all that stress was going on, life would have been a lot more um, uh, lower anxiety, as lower level, lower level of anxiety. So yeah, I, you're right. I have a, I, I've developed this track record. There are people as like you who look at what I've done and say, "Wow, I've, I've had job interview people call me in for job interviews, and then tell and then told me they weren't really going to hire me for the job, but they really wanted me to come in so they could meet me." Mm-hmm. Which I yeah, thought, why didn't you just buy me a cup of coffee and <laughs> save, we could save the whole thing? About it. Save the but, awkwardness. Yeah, right. I mean, exactly. But, um, uh, yeah, so that's, I, I have to kind of say, it's kind of cool to realize that there are people like you who see me in that light, but I certainly wasn't aware while I was going through mm-hmm. this. I think it, it has to be a generational thing because, I mean, Obviously, I watch movies all the way to to the silent, you know, the the three shot films of 1900. So, you know, when when you watch the progression of cinema and then when television was sort of born for a long time, there was that sort of big brother, little brother where there was feature films in the movie theater and there was television. But you mentioned wanting to be, you know, this A-list editor work on these A-list uh, sort of features. But, uh, you know, I'm not going to get into it too much yet. I want to move on to it. But you sort of were there with X Files from its inception. You know, you were the editor that sort of set the pace for how that show was cut from the pilot. And and you talk about A list movies. I mean, that's not just an A list TV show. That show has the same currency as you know. People will talk just as much about Blade Runner as they'll talk about X Files if it doesn't have a bigger following. So. It, you know, the stuff that you end up working on at the time, like I said, I think it's generational because there was that big brother, little brother thing, but because of the digital revolution and, you know, what HBO was doing in the late 90s and now you have Netflix and Amazon, people didn't forget about the shows that came out back then, even though now there's a sort of blurred line where you have Scorsese working on TV shows and and David Fincher working on TV shows and everyone sort of jumping back and forth. The shows of, of yesteryear, are definitely not forgotten. I mean, like I said, X Files today holds the same currency and inspires just as many people as, say, Blade Runner. So it's it's incredible that you know to be a part of something like that. You know, before that sort of revolution, and to right. get to see what that, happened with it. I'm just saying that at the time when you're in there, doing oh yeah, it, you have no clue. Yeah. 
Yeah, yeah. It's, it's sort of like a, another funny story where when Led Zeppelin came out, they became the biggest, the biggest sort of band in the world, and then everyone's looking at these these other bands from the '60s, Jimi Hendrix and Clapton and and the Who, and they're like, well, we were already doing that. We were already being loud and you know and all the 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 same thing. But for some reason, you know, when Led Zeppelin came out, they became this biggest thing. And it's sort of like you said, you didn't even realize you were a part of that that sort of thing until now you get to see it. I just uh, finished reading Eric Idle's memoir that he just that he just published. And he, he was very close with George Harrison. And, and he quotes George Harrison saying, saying, if we had known we were going to be the Beatles, we would have tried harder. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like you said, now you're getting more phone calls. It's like, well, if, well, if I only knew, you know. Uh, and, and I mean, uh, cause we talked about alienation and there's another show you worked on that, that sort of, you know, alienation had, a, has its cult following and, and people just sort of look back at it as inspiration. And then there's another show around the same time that you worked on that I have to talk about because it was so original. They actually did, they were doing a special on TV some years ago about shows that were, I think it was called too, too ahead of its time. And that was, uh, cop rock. You know, it's funny. I, I, I went through periods of time when I thought I should drop that off my resume or not admit to having been involved, involved with it. But I, I, I agree with you. It was um, a crazy idea, and they, Stephen Bochco and and um, um, oh, this is unfortunately you've reached me at an age where names click out of my head. Either. Greg Hoblet. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, they were stick. They they were going to make no adjustments to it. I mean, there were things about it that didn't work. There was, I think, uh, one particular mistake they made in how they went about it that I, I might have. But I, I. But whatever it was, the point was they were going to ride it whether it went up or down. And, you know, it's a good thing the guy like Bochco could afford this mm -hmm. to take this kind of a risk. Um, and, uh, uh, yeah, I, I really, I sometimes, I remember sometimes telling people I worked on it and getting people laughing at me, but I, but I just thought it was cool to be around that. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, it went down in flames, but you know, it was a big explosion. <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's like, it did, where you but said, I mean, there was this big, slim pickings riding the atomic bomb. <laughs> You know, yeah, but now you sort of have musicals making this big comeback, uh, especially in television with, with Glee. And, and, and I, I just feel it was one of those shows where there's something there that could have possibly worked. But like you said, there were flaws that just weren't really worked on. And, you know, as an as an editor, you're sort of the last line of defense, because once the project gets in your hands after you, it's ready for for sort of the world. So how do you go about when you see something is, I don't want to say terribly off, but when, when something's just not working and, and you have ideas of how to maybe make it work, but it's not necessarily what what the producers, directors, the people behind the project wanted from it. How do you go about sort of working with people like you said, Bochco already at that point could afford to, to sort of have a failure. They, they sort of have some cachet. How do you share your opinion and say, this isn't right? You know, not, not that it's necessarily a war of egos, but you know, sometimes people just don't see something when they're in the middle of the storm. And as an editor, you sort of have that responsibility. Well, as an editor, all you have is an opinion. You don't have a, mm -hmm. you, don't, you don't have a decision. You don't have any authority um, other than, uh, although it is interesting about then I was younger now at, at the age I am now, um, when I'm working, it's, I have, I have to be careful. I feel I feel I need to be careful what I say because people do look at me and say, "Oh well, he must know more than everybody else because he's still alive and he's doing." Mm -hmm. um, but so I guess there's always some element of diplomacy in editing, um, and you have to realize that you make suggestions and they're very often not taken. Um, I do recall one cop rock episode that we remixed. After, after I was came in to see the playback of the sound mix, 
And I just thought, and, and the, the, the brief thing of what was problematic for me about Cop Rock was the separation of the musical and the dra dramatic elements so that, so that they were literally done by different teams of people mm. um, and mixed you know, se separately so that, so that it didn't integrate as well as I thought it could. And there was one time when it was so blatantly off that I, I recall saying, I guess it was to Greg Hobbit doing a playback, that, that just, we had to go back and do that better. And they went back to the mix stage and did that and did. But he could have said, no, that's okay, we'll live with it. I mean, sometimes, you know, the things you want to do as an editor require, in order to do them, are going to require somebody to spend more money. And I don't have any say about it. I mean, that's one of the nice things about, about having a position like an editor is, as opposed to a producer mm -hmm. is you can make any suggestion you want and if you're not obligated to justify how you're going to pay for it. <laughs> I mean, you may be asked in reverse. You know, somebody may say, you know, we have too many visual effects in this show and can we cut it, recut it so that there are fewer. So that can happen. So I'm, I'm not saying you, you're completely isolated mm -hmm. from financial things, but suggesting that you go back to a mix stage and you know that you have to yeah. you know, seriously it's, it's, and somebody did it i mean what i try to what i try to never suggest is reshoots I, I always feel like my job is to make it make anything i do as best as it can be without with the footage i have and then i leave it for someone else to ultimately say okay that just we have to reshoot this or some whatever some whatever it is that that's almost the, I may ask for a pickup shot once in a great while. Um, but I always, I consider it almost a mark of a, fail, a failing if I, if I uh, haven't given up, if I say to reshoot this. So that's, that I want to say. But um, other than that, you, I just, I'm not shy about throwing at my two cents. And I've, I, I, it's been a learning process for me because I am verbal to actually figure out, remember that it's, it, it's easy for me to get caught up in the, in the footage or the story or how that's working. And then sometimes, and, and I've had experiences in my life where I neglected the fact that the person I was talking to maybe was the director, maybe had shot this stuff and that had invested his own creative soul into mm -hmm. it. And here I am tearing it up. <laughs> Um, whereas it, from my mind, I'm just trying to make it better. And whereas the person I'm working with is just hearing that I'm criticizing his work. And, and that's what I mean about the diplomacy. You have to have a certain sensitivity with it, which I think is, is probably, you know, a flaw in my own personality and in, in, in career, but you, that it wasn't as sensitive as an act. I wish I were looking back in understanding how the things you say are actually sounding and being taken by the people you're collaborating. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the way you describe it, it's almost like the the director is the parent of this child, and then you're the the preschool teacher who's there to say your child needs to play better with others. And and it's you know they're the parent, but at the same time you have your sort of role with with the the process. There are uh, more analogies one can come up with from editing than almost any other <laughs> job. but that's another that, that that's a, that's another one so, so but the trick but uh, what i'm saying is that that there is a trick to getting your idea onto the screen in a way that that engages people with it um and you know sometimes you have to be um just the idea of just being boldly saying, this is what I think may not be the way in, the, in, in, in a given moment with a given set of people to go about that. Yeah. And most of the, the nice thing about computers, about this transition to film from film to computers, is that it did lead, it, it does lead to less, lead to less talking and more just showing. Mm -hmm. Because you don't, you know, with, with the film, if, if you want to go in a certain direction or if someone wanted you to go in a certain direction that you, thought was just wrong, it could take a long time. And then you did it, and in fact, it was wrong. It could take a long time 
you know, you do, and uh, you had to have some kind of system for you know, if I get back to where you were to reconstitute the footage of it. Like, whereas computers have really made that up. If at now, if any, if you think of it, just try it. I know. Yeah. And, and, whereas and, now you can show five options as opposed exactly, to just showing less, one and discussing the four right, others. So there's less need to be to it's uh, to rely that much on words to get your ideas across because you say, well. Look at this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, if you have if you have fundamental story issues and you're trying to restructure, talk about well, wait a minute, this doesn't make sense now. Or we, we need to whatever. That, then yeah, that's when you just say it was inspired by Godard. Right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you know you you worked on some television shows called classics, some shows that didn't work out, and then comes along a show called X Files. I mean, it, it was on Fox. Fox in general was sort of just basically what Netflix is doing now, which is trying everything, trying, you know, experimenting with a lot of different types of shows. And this was one of them. And and you came there from the beginning. You you cut the pilot of the show and, and worked uh, on the first few seasons, I believe. Uh, what was that experience sort of? working on that show that became so big and it's not a show that necessarily took that much time to become that big uh pretty quickly it became something people looked forward to on sunday nights started as friday nights i think and then they moved it as i recall yeah 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 uh what was the experience like well the pilot was a lot of fun i i really thoroughly enjoyed working with the people i was working with um, I, uh, both David Duchovny and Jillian Anderson were raw as actors. They, they required a lot of massaging. I mean, uh, uh, for my money, David was too, playing the character too low key and Jillian was playing the character too strident. And so trying to pump up David and bring back Jillian, mm -hmm. I recall that. Um, I just remember enjoying the group in the cutting room uh, a lot. Uh, Chris Carter and then Danny Sackheim, the, the producer, um, the director. The director, I really is sort of disappeared from my world. I think he got involved with the American Film Institute for a long time. Bob, um, what's his last name? Right? Um, Robert, ah, he was the director. I, <laughs> terrible again, this thing with the names. Check your IMDb, I'm sure. So. Um, just a second, I've got to switch positions a little bit. So, so, that, so, so that was fun, and it wasn't, I, it, it, it was kind of raw to me. It was, it, it was not a slick production, and, um, and it seemed like just a step up from, like you say, the, some of the stuff they were doing, like when animals attacked and <laughs> other UFO kind of things. I think, Celebrity boxing was a big think, one also. I, uh, right. Um, I remember, uh, I remember uh, we, that when we first showed the, sh the show to uh, the, the head of the, stu of the studio, Peter Roth, who's been the head of Warner's for, forever. And he turned to us after the show, after the first screening, he said that was well-crafted. And we all walked out the door and looked at each other and said, well-crafted, we're in big trouble. <laughs> but um, uh, we kept working on it, and I guess it got better. And I think, as I recall, we started hearing that the network was shopping it around to foreign distributors. And for some, it was clicking with foreign televisions. They were getting a lot of orders. And I think that made them feel comfortable with them being fun, with putting it on the air. I remember, I, I am proud of one thing in that movie that nobody except now your audience will know I think it was my doing. Um, in the mixing stage, there's a scene, there's a scene where uh, the plane that Mulder and Scully are in going to somewhere, and I think it's Washington, to, 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 to investigate whatever it was they were going <laughs> Because it suddenly loses altitude. And there's this, you, you know, huge whatever, the power drops, the plane drops, and then it's just okay again. 
and that everyone is kind of like recovering at that moment. And I said it on the soundstage, you know, let's we need a baby crying. And they put that into the mix, and it was just lovely. And I thought, yeah, that's my big contribution to the show. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, that, that show had a lot in terms of, you know, there were terrifying moments, and it had a lot of comedic moments. That, that show definitely had a lot of humor. So, um, so you mentioned... Yeah, Later. you mentioned. I don't think it. I don't think it started out that way, and I because I don't. For one thing, I don't think David was good with humor at the beginning. He the the growth of those two mm. actors as actors to see that was stunning. I think Jillian faster than David, but mm -hmm. David went from a guy who did not who who. I mean, Chris would give him funny lines that just would fall flat in in the very beginning, and. Gradually over time, he picked it up. He got, he figured out how to play that character funny, and then we just went a whole other level up when mm -hmm. uh, when they brought Darren Morgan in to, to write episodes, and that must have been second or third season. Mm -hmm. so, but it's, it's funny because you said getting typecast where it's people wouldn't want to talk to you about cutting comedies, and I feel it's so much more difficult to get the humor out of a show that maybe isn't you know, first and foremost, a comedy. And, you know, a show like that, to get the humor across, you have to be, I mean, incredible craftsman. Like you said, it's well-crafted. Well, that's saying something. Yeah, I thought in his case, he was at a loss for words, and so that's what he came up with. But yeah. uh, uh, Because it was, like, so strange. I agree. I mean, that when I have, when I have every once in a great while interviewed for a comedic, Show I always point that exact thing out that mm -hmm. that most things I do have have comedic mm -hmm. comedic mm -hmm. elements and uh, uh, the uh, the episode of X Files I thought that, that I did that was funniest was the, uh, the, the final final what's his name final repose Joe Bo uh, Peter Boyle was in it Clyde Ruckman's final mm -hmm. repose um, written by Darren Morton. Got an Emmy for it. I think that guy's probably one of the uh, And so, yeah, there's a Deadwood, very, very funny show. Yeah. You're, you're up to it. Uh, in fact, uh, although David Milch is a very funny man, what it would in fact happen is we'd shoot a lot of very funny stuff and gradually remove it because ultimately he wanted the show to be serious. Mm -hmm. uh, and there was a case where the humor would undermine the gravitas. So we did, yeah, we did a lot well, of things that, 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 that the audiences that audiences never saw. But you're yeah. right. It's it's uh, there's it's it's a, so these these categories of what they are just just the way graduate degrees are. They're ways mm -hmm. of limiting the number of people you can interview by saying, okay, you fit in this category. Well, you don't, and therefore we don't have to talk to you because ultimately, with the, there are enough people in any one of these categories, you're going to find somebody who yeah. works. So, so you're, if you're going to move from TV to, to uh, features, you probably need a director or a producer who's making that move who wants you to go with them and can yeah. pursue the studio. You know? Well, and X Files, they did make the movie, and you cut it. And yes, and what was, was sort of the experience going from the show to the movie where? You know, at, at the time, there was still that sort of separation between television and well, movies, where was, a show looked like a show and a movie looked like a movie. It was incredibly exciting because that's that was I thought, okay, I'm doing a big budget movie, and um, whatever for any number of reasons, the, the, the industry didn't perceive it that maybe if they either thought I was doing a big budget television episode. Um, and I think the movie also, they, they tried to, to broaden the show's appeal. I think they wanted an audience that would be bigger than just the TV audience. I don't think they got that. I think that ultimately mm -hmm. people who wanted to see that movie were uh, people who, saw it, who were fans of the TV show, and which was enough to make it a profitable movie, but not enough to make it a blockbuster hit. Mm -hmm. And... So, yeah, in the aftermath, 
it didn't get me where I wanted to go. But at the time, thinking after all these things I had tried to break in, now I was doing, you know, a feature film. I got my first agent and um, all the perks of having a big crew and, and so on. It was, and the snacks were better. <laughs> uh, that that's ultimately really right. craft services, you know. That that's how you know you've made it. Right. I put on a lot of weight on that. Um but there were a lot of problems to be solved in that in that movie. There were a lot of things that Chris conceived that people had no idea how to do. And a lot of it did have to be kind of massaged in the in, in the cutting. So I I'm really proud of that. Film. Yeah, I mean, because at that point, you sort of really got in the grasp of the TV show. Uh, and now to jump to, you know, from this hour format where, like, you know, I mentioned you you sort of have the constraints, you have the FCC, you have the commercial breaks, you you have the firm sort of length of the episode because they need to fit it into with, with everything else to a movie where you have more flexibility. I mean, what's that sort of the difference knowing just something as simple as that you don't have to edit around commercials or you're not locked into the 52, 53 minutes? Um, it's not um, as big an issue as uh, as apparently from your question you, you, you think it is. I, I guess... I guess the biggest the biggest problem is uh, is fitting a time a time slot when when you feel that the, sh the show is a particular show is right but it's still a minute long and someone says you have to get that minute out of it and and yeah you think maybe you're hurting it it's 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 actually rare that making something move sh be shorter and move faster damages it but so, so so if anything i probably brought that mentality to the movie to try to mm -hmm. you know keep it keep it uh paced up and and, and moving quickly oh, you just you do have to adjust to that the, there, there is a thing with the not the time constraint but the image size is an issue where the, the audience's eyes have greater a real estate to roam on a uh, movie screen and you have to give them the time to, to see what they're supposed to be seeing. And so that requires a, some adjustment of your sense of pace. Um, and there have been uh, some TV, actually that Clyde Bruckman's Final Repose is an example of a show that I think went on the air at its not its best version. I thought its best version was a cut or two earlier when it was slightly long and had to be had to be shortened. I but you know if you don't have that as to compare it to, which audiences don't. I mean, a lot of the time you have to remember. One of the frustrations can sometimes be with editing, or actually everywhere along the way in filmmaking, is that you have a vision or you know what something could be or should be, and it doesn't achieve that. Um, trying sometimes you have to let go, and then the good news is the audience isn't coming to it with a preconception of what it should have been or could have been. Mm -hmm. They're just yeah, and what's actually there. So, but no, yeah, I, I just I, a lot of the thing. The commercials are are written in, and then sometimes you re you, you realize for restructuring you have to put them somewhere somewhere else. It's it's more of an annoyance than a huge creative problem. Um, I mean, but, right now, it's it's not anything that if you're cutting for Netflix or you're cutting for, for HBO, if you need to go a minute over, if you need to go 10 minutes over, I mean, you, you look at shows, uh, Game of Thrones episodes will be an hour and a half, you know, which is a feature length film. Do you think for for editors coming up, it's better or worse to work the way you did where you sort of don't have that choice you you have to push yourself to sort of nail that 53 minute mark or or like you said 
uh, where the, the last thing you want to do is ask for a reshoot because, you know, if you're not getting it done with what you have, you, you feel you're not accomplishing something. Um, it's, you know, it's so hard to know what life is like for editors <laughs> coming up. I, I taught a, uh, I did a master class at the union, the editors union, the weekend of, you know, editing for, for members who wanted to practice editing and obviously the editing narrative. Um, and it was interesting listening to them at lunch, talking about various problems they had on their jobs. And you know, some of them were assistants on reality shows, and they were writing reality shows, doing trailers or this or that. And it was interesting to sit there and have no idea what the hell these people were talking about. I mean, they were talking about whatever the technical issues of having 15 cameras that weren't synchronized correctly. I mean, I was, I was kind of trying to translate this into something that I understood. I, I, clearly, there is a whole set of um, experiences that people are coming up now are having that are foreign to me, I, you know, because I, that just wasn't, wasn't my, my world. But I, the thing is, as I said, I teach. And when I teach, the, the only thing I teach the story and and the role that editing plays in storytelling it's hard for me to envision that being different or that changing and as long as if if, if you're, focus, you're focusing on that then these other issues about okay we're storytelling but we also have to get a minute out of it because the network says well we're storytelling or like you said you know, uh, we're seeing too much skin in the sex scene or whatever it might be. Those become kind of, yeah, technical, mechanical uh, cleanups that you have to, that you do have, you, you have to do. But you have, you, your focus for anything, whether it's the feature or, or the TV show, has got to be, to me, engaging the audience in the story. And the rest of it is kind of secondary, uh, the way I see it. And I hope that people who are learning the craft now are also at some point picking up on that. I think that the, uh, the way the unions have changed, so, you know, where they're more wild, wild west than they used to be, where they used to be structured with apprentices and Assistance. Unfortunately, those were almost always people who were the children of other people in the union, and that was the problem. But but there was a there was a built-in mentoring process to that, which I think maybe the union is trying to grasp at recapturing with this masterclass idea. Um, I, yeah, be, being understanding that your basic job is is that you're a professional storyteller and that the most important thing you can you want to do is keep your audience's eyes glued to the screen and that there are ways to go about that yeah. but it's it's interesting uh, i i have had a discussion with a young fellow i know who's involved with virtual reality and i scratch my head about that because people say well you know you can look anywhere you want to I'm thinking, but one of the main tools a filmmaker has is to tell the audience look at this and imagine the world around it just look at this right now for this these yeah. this happens you're looking here and then i'm gonna then i want to show you what's there i don't want you looking around all over the place and, and right so it was like how do you tell a story the virtual reality how do you what trick i mean i, I imagine if anybody is determined to use virtual reality for storytelling they'll figure this out but uh, I don't know if anyone has yet. I don't know if anybody's done a virtual reality story. Um, yeah, there is that sort of debate whether technology went from helping to tell a story to become a, a crutch for the story. And I, I guess only time will tell. Uh, like you said, with virtual reality, is it going to help tell stories in new ways? Or is it just a novelty that sort of makes it easier to get away with? Well, we clearly I'm have this other, this other universe now of interactive mm -hmm. stuff, mm -hmm. right? Games mostly, and, and and I think the virtual reality as an interactive thing is remarkable, and apparently it has like serious 
medical uses. And, mm -hmm. and I've heard now they have virtual colonoscopies. I don't understand that, but it sounds better than the. Uh, <laughs> it sounds a more welcoming yeah. experience. Yeah. Um, but the point is, I'm sure I think virtual reality is amazing technology, and it's. But it is. A, but as to narrative storytelling, that alone. Uh, the question of how do you use it, or would would you use it, or you know, would, I mean, are you going to use it just to say you used it? I, that that would seem. You know, I mean, clearly, yeah, it could be a novelty in the world of three D. I had a student ask me if I thought there was if I could think of a movie that would have been better if it had that was not in three D. That would have been better if it had been in three D. And I, all I could think of was there might have been some movies that could have made more money. But couldn't figure out how they creatively did mm -hmm. because again you're gauging people emotionally usually through the, through the vehicle of characters so whether you can see those characters in three dimensions I'm mean, sure it yeah. makes a difference and um which doesn't mean which is, but that doesn't mean yeah that, that you can't make money um using these things and just but my point really was that I think storytelling is storytelling is storytelling. You know, mm -hmm. um, so software doesn't you know, like, doesn't tell a story for you. And, and yeah. Well, I want to get to to some some projects you worked on later on, uh, because you went from sort of these TV shows, network TV shows, when network was king, to working uh, on stuff like. Deadwood, Hell on Wheels, uh, you know, Sneaky Pete. These are shows that the line has already been crossed where, you know, television isn't really a movie theater's little brother anymore. A lot of these shows are more anticipated than, than a lot of movies coming out. When you're cutting something now, knowing where, where sort of television is and, and what these platforms are doing, uh, and the kinds of filmmakers that are sort of flocking to television uh, or, you know, the, the equivalents of television today, Netflix, the HBO, Amazon, all that stuff. Now do you have an opportunity to sort of appreciate the projects that you're working on and sort of think, okay, television might not have been necessarily the, the primary goal, but this is it right now. This is the sort of peak of, of storytelling the way we have it, visual storytelling. Okay. Um, I, I just want to mention that something just happened to the connection and you froze mm -hmm. up and then you started talking out of sync. Um, yeah, 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 I believe it's all back <laughs> now. It, it seems to all be good on my end. Uh, okay. I'm sorry. So I... I, I was distracted by that and kind of lost. Oh, no, uh, basically what I was just trying to say is, I mean, when you worked on a show like X-Files, like you said, when, when you're in the eye of the storm, you don't really get to notice it. But now it's pretty evident that television is not the little brother to movies anymore. Uh, I mean, the filmmakers that are flocking to television, to Netflix, to HBO, uh, th these projects are just as anticipated as some of the big movies coming out. I mean, Game of Thrones is, I, mean, I don't know what movie has the people waiting for it to come out as much as that show. So when you get to work on something like Deadwood, uh, on Hell on Wheels, on Sneaky Pete, when you get to work on these projects, do you get to appreciate it as sort of, I accomplished that goal on, on working on, on the most important stuff that people sort of watch and enjoy? Um, well, I'm, I mean, I was very aware on Deadwood that I was doing something, working on something remarkable. Um, I, it, 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 it doesn't compare to Game of Thrones because it was, um, I was also aware that it was going to be a taster's choice, mm -hmm. uh, that it was not going to be X-Files, it was not going to be a huge hit, it was going to, and, and I believe that, that, that Deadwood is um, far more appreciated within the motion picture industry. Mm -hmm than it is among the general public. Um, that's my guess. I don't have any, I can't back it up statistically, but I, um, you know, when I interact with people who are not in the film business, a lot of them will say they've heard of Deadwood, but they never really watched it. Whereas when I interact with people who work in the industry, everybody is like, 
knocked out that I got to open. But so I, I, yeah, I was very aware that I was working. And David Milch is an obvious genius. His his writing, the way he writes, which is not a not a process I think very many people either could rec- would, uh, follow or would be allowed to by a, by a by a production company. Oh, that then that's to me what's remarkable about HBO is that they pick people like David Milch or or Benioff and, and Weiss or whoever, and they say, go, do your show, right? Um, some of these other shows, you still get uh, networks giving a lot of feedback, and they kind of expect you to try to be there. The, the executive suites want to, want to know that, that you're trying their notes. But HBO in particular, is, I never, I, they may have been calling David with feedback on cuts. I don't really, I never, I never heard that here was a note that the studio wanted done, right? I never heard that on, on, on that show. But it was unmistakable, unlike, say, X-Files, where at first you don't realize that this is really clicking um, with the audience. Uh, and I want to go back to that, something about that, too, which is interesting. But um, with, with Deadwood sitting there by myself, so, so up working up at the Melody Ranch, for so I was like, right there at the, at, at, the, at the set where you just felt like you'd walk into the time machine anyway, because everybody around you was in these costumes and the whole place. And so it just was so well dressed. So the production was on. The cast was astounding. It was, it was, I've never, I've never worked with a better ensemble cast. And, um, and yeah, that was definitely a case of knowing it at the time while I was working on it. That this was not, not knowing whether audiences would take it, but knowing I was doing something really, working on something really remarkable. Um, and I don't know that I've had that experience since. Where I where I thought that you know this was the, the, that this is can be groundbreaking and it's mm. like I you know I've, I've worked I've certainly worked on things that were good since but nothing nothing that that comes quite up to that yet. Um, I'm not sure if that answered the question. <laughs> You're yeah, right. yeah, definitely. And, you know, it, it's funny because after all these years, the, the fact that you can say that, because I was having some other conversations and heard the same thing, people coming out of college saying, well, I want to work on movies. Uh, they came up later and, you know, while well, they were saying the movies that they wanted to make were no longer really being made. So they sort of had to go into television because that's where there was just more opportunity. And it's sort of now, like, like I said, a lot of the movies that, that, people used to want to make that's now happening in television so it's going to be interesting to see to see the next generation where you know whereas before you sort of go you watch taxi driver and you say i want to make that movie now you know people film school students are going to be saying i want to make deadwood i want to tell that story i don't want to tell you know nothing against superheroes and men in tights but i want to tell a story like deadwood uh well that just all has to do also with the economics of distribution Mm -hmm. and the digital that the digital age both made available and, you know, just like newspapers, right? The, the, yeah. You know, going, going, went out of way, but becoming fewer to, mm-hmm. for the same reasons that, that um, you, you have to watch these movies at Oscar time to see the really well-performed, well-acted movies. And then they give them awards and then you find out that actually nobody in the country has seen those movies. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> so. Well, there was something, uh, a, a statistic where a movie just nominated for an Oscar, they end up making a certain amount of million dollars more on the movie just because of that nomination, where it sort of works like oh, PR and marketing for the movie. Yeah. That's always been true of the Oscars. That's always what it was about. Always, well, awards have always been about either making more money for the movie or, you know, for me, Emmy nominations or ACE awards, mm-hmm. it's 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 it markets me. It makes my resume better. It yeah. doesn't mean I'm, it doesn't make me a better editor. It's just it's all very. Shh, I, 
Don't it's give all, away the secret. It's all scarecrow getting the diploma and uh, 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 mm -hmm. the, the Tin Man getting the heart and all that. It just it, it's it's sort of some kind of uh, cachet and validation that, uh, and that's what that's what all the good stuff is. And because it's not a competitive movie making and editing are not competitive. Score. Yeah, I mean, you can't really measure something. There's not like a scoreboard where, where you can sort of measure. Uh, you did mention right. something uh, we're going to leave off on. You mentioned uh, something about X-Files not knowing yeah. whether it was clicking. Right. I, I wanted to say this about X-Files. Another theory, which some maybe some cultural anthropologists or sociologists will see if I'm right. I think that a lot of the reason that X-Files was the phenomenon it was, was that it came into the public consciousness, or certainly my consciousness, along with the internet. Hmm. And I believe that the original watchers of the X-Files were the same kind of nerds who were experimenting with the internet. I got my first internet account it was either the first, might have been the first season it's coming. First or second season. I think it was the first. I think it was the part way through the first season. Because a couple of the writers were showing up with these printouts of the day after we'd aired the show of people who had been chatting about it on the internet and saying this. You never, ever before that. This was, for me, this was the, the, the really remarkable thing that, demarcation, something I'd never experienced up until that point. To have to see a show on the air, you might wait a week and get to hear what your ratings were. But to have somebody walk in with printed out commentary on the show and speculation and philosophizing about it the day morning after it had been it was remarkable. And that led me to say, I gotta find out what this is. And I got my first internet account. It was still, you were still dealing with command lines. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was not a computer person at all. I had to get a book and learn how to do this stuff. Um, there, you know, there were kind of web browsers, but there were very few websites. You got onto these lists of chat rooms and uh, that, uh, that kind of, I, I recall, um, I recall my first ever participate the thing of participating in an internet chat and again i had done some command line thing and this was all vaguely like dos and i i was a mac user even then i didn't know that these command line. um there it was is it the last show last episode of the first or second season had some scully is in some kind of star chamber Inquisition at the FBI, and and Chris decided to play one of the one of the uh, questionnaires, one of the interrogators, and he he has a line to her where she says something, and he says, "You're lying," right? And so after that show was off the air, I immediately went and turned on my computer and found that where people were chatting about the, about that show, which was just amazing to me. This is. You talk about, we take the internet for granted. I'm talking about, you have to put yourself when there were no cell phones and no one took the internet for granted. Hardly anyone knew what it was, except these hobbyists. And there I am watch, watching a scrolling chat of people discussing this show that I edited. <laughs> has just been on the air. And then I see someone say, I think Chris, Chris Carter was, was, was actually in that episode. And somebody said, yeah, he was that fellow in the last scene who accuses um, Scully of lying. And somebody else says, yeah, which she was. <laughs> <laughs> and that debates begin. And, and I, so that's I, far out. And that's fascinating. I wrote, at that point, I wrote the first thing I've ever written, done on the Internet, posted on the Internet. I wrote, just goes to show you can't fool Chris. <laughs> And then somebody immediately said, well, of course, he knew she was lying. He'd written the script. <laughs> and if they only knew, they were talking to the editor of the, the show. You well, know? Right. I mean, it, it, but, but also there was that confusion where where people would read that that um, 
I think that David, I read somewhere that David Duchovny had a dog. I think his name was Blue at the time. And and then people were wondering where Mulder's dog Blue was. It, 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 it started blurring where people were. It, yeah, that sounds blurred. more like the internet of today, the, yeah. the sort of creepy side of it. So yeah, but that was going on. Well, it wasn't so yeah. much creepy as just that it was, it, I mean, I didn't, it wasn't creeped out by it, but, but the blurring of the show from, from your yeah. reality. I, I think that, that, that the, the, the internet obviously, as we know, blew up over, yeah. over, over the next few years. And so did the X-Files. I, I just, it, it I absolutely just, did. And congratulations I, because, you know, surfer, you know, Chris was yeah. a surfer. I mean, still is, I think. And, I just, I think he's, he caught that wave. I think I, that's my, that's my personal theory. I don't know well, how to say that. Thank I, you so much for, for joining me today. Uh, we're going to be signing off, but, uh, you know, thank you for, for chatting with me. This was, I was very much looking forward to this because you were a part of something that we all love and are inspired by. And, it's going to live on forever. Uh, so, you know, to, to be able to chat with you about it, I, I hope you, you know, had a great conversation as well. And, I uh, and, and sort of talking about some of these shows that, you know, like you said, when, when you're in the eye of the storm, you don't really notice it. But someone's looking and studying in your work the way you studied someone else's. And, and that's sort of the the mentoring, the paying it forward without directly mentoring someone. You know, your work gets to mentor someone. So, so well, it is why I'm interested in teaching, frankly. Yeah. I do feel like I know something now, and yeah. some should find out about it. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me on, and good luck with the uh, with the whole series.